Leaving Spider-Man Homecoming, I had so many positive things to say, from the storyline to the tone to the action, but one thing that really stood out to me was how amazing the Vulture was as a character. He is one of Marvel's best villains, and I think I figured out why he stood out so much. It's because he's actually the hero of Spider-Man Homecoming. Now obviously Spider-Man is the titular character and the protagonist of the story, but I think if you look at it from the Vulture's perspective, Spider-Man is definitely the villain. Now you might think, well, I can do that thought experiment with any film that has a sympathetic antagonist, but this film is different because aside from the Vulture's hero-like traits, he actually experiences a very specific type of hero's journey that's generally reserved for heroes in movies. He is an everyman that struggles a lot, who's smart but not omniscient, who's constantly responding and adjusting to hardships mainly in the form of Spider-Man, but most importantly, he is not one note. He's not defined by one tragedy or vice. The Vulture is uniquely multidimensional and grows as a character by the end. Now there are other villains that will check these points off, and the greatest villains all have clear goals with clear motivations, but it's the complexity and subtleties of the Vulture that make him uniquely worthy of the term hero. And when I say hero, I mean a person we root for for their admirable qualities. I know people have different definitions, I just mean it in the colloquial sense, and I'll pick up other traits along the way. So let's get started. So many villains have one event or flaw that sets things in motion. We'll start with another very well-written Spider-Man villain, Otto Octavius from Spider-Man 2. There's the catastrophic failure of his energy showcase that results in the tragic death of his wife. But this happened because he believed he could change the world, even when he was warned of the potential dangers involved. So hubris is his flaw. Other villains can be summed up with one flaw or idea, a thirst for power, a longing of validation, proving a philosophical point, or the most common one, revenge. Whiplash, Justin Hammer, Voltron, Ultron, sorry, Baron Zemo. There are sub-motivations, but for the most part, these characters are fairly one-dimensional. The Vulture on his face doesn't seem to deviate too far from this idea. His primary motivation is providing for and protecting his family. But when you look at the sub-themes, that's when things get interesting. The first scene, he's fighting to keep his job for his family, but also for the families of the men who work for him. So right off the bat, he is thinking about the well-being of multiple parties. Once he finds out it was Stark Industries, he also holds a grudge against them. So then he becomes the Vulture. And as the Vulture, he's a CEO that gets his hands dirty, doing the most dangerous job of actually stealing the Chitari shipments. No one is going to take the fall if he's the one piloting the suit. Now, he's not completely selfless. Maybe a part of him enjoys the thrill, the power, we don't know. And that's also a reoccurring theme in why he's so interesting. Like a real old school man of strength who's carrying the world on his back, he keeps his true motivations on the inside. The frustration just leaks out of his eyes. And damn, those are some impressive eyes. He doesn't keep his rage inside 100% of the time. He definitely lets it out on Spider-Man and on his workers, but he has managed to completely protect his family from the unsavory parts of his life. That sounds pretty noble to me. So he has a company that's not doing well. He's not directly hurting anyone. Remember, Stark Industries is made from the same type of blood money and Iron Man doesn't even have a family. Unlike so many villains who have death and really sad backstories in their history, the Vulture has no big tragedy. Losing his job sucks, but he has a perfectly alive family who's happy, healthy, and well taken care of. He also does not have a master plan to hurt anyone or take over the world. He just wants to keep making a living, keep the status quo. And then Spider-Man comes into the picture, and this web-slinging ball of destruction is the inciting incident for our hero forcing him into action. While the Vulture is fighting for his family, for his workers, for his way of life, Spider-Man is fighting for completely selfish reasons. He wants Tony Stark's validation and acceptance into the elite team that he feels entitled to. Kind of reminds me of another talented trainee that was a little too ambitious. And Spider-Man is powerful, he's got super strength, agility, and top of the line Stark technology. The Vulture just has the suit he built himself and his smarts. The Vulture is the underdog, and it shows not once is he able to beat Spider-Man and actually get the shipments he needs. So they fight back and forth and we end up with that amazing car scene where the vulture figures out Spider-Man is Peter Parker. 
And this script's decision to have him find out that he is Spider-Man right there makes us respect the Vulture even more. In all the other Spider-Man films, it's been you see the Goblin or the other Green Goblin or the younger Green Goblin connecting the dots, but they only get so far as, okay, I got it. I'll threaten Peter Parker and he'll tell me where Spider-Man is. As the audience, we're always a step ahead and this is intentionally done because writers know audiences like to figure out stuff and feel smart. But in this movie, no, the Vulture instantly gets it. Just to clarify, we know Peter Parker is Spider-Man, but we can feel the finely tuned wheels turning in the Vulture's head. This guy is sharp and we experience the oh shit, he's Spider-Man right there with him. And then we have the rest of the scene where he threatens to kill Peter and his family. He's giving Peter one last chance to just leave him alone. And what does Peter, our villain, do? He attacks him again, this time at his home base. I'm not even gonna talk about the fact that he's taking his daughter out. That is, that's intimidation. And if you still don't believe the vulture is actually the hero, pay attention to this next scene for two reasons. One, in his secret lair or home base, he gives his spiel on fighting for the little guy. He's just a blue collar worker fighting the man, trying to support his family. It's a compelling and very relevant speech that most of us should relate to because most of us aren't billionaire corporations. And two, when Peter asks him why he told him all that, the vulture responds he was waiting for his suit to warm up. That means he didn't expect Peter Parker to come. Spider-Man is too powerful and could instantly incapacitate him. He's forced to come up with a plan to buy time, and that's this speech, just long enough for his suit to warm up. So that means the Vulture outsmarts Spider-Man, and that is like the go-to hero thing to do, probably one of the strongest points of my argument. He's an underdog using his brain trying to outsmart a physically superior adversary. And that also means his threat in the car he didn't plan on following through. Just like earlier in the film when he didn't plan on killing his men with the incineration gun, the worker's death obviously doesn't bother him much. Okay, sure, our great hero has sociopathic traits, but see Batman and a lot of other superheroes. My point is he's human, he makes mistakes. In so many other movies, we have these villains with awesome master plans that aren't messed up till the very end, but the Vulture is struggling throughout the whole movie with Spider-Man and he's also struggling with his own errors. As a side note, but also very relevant, in the climax of the film, he's also finally using the vacuum technology made by one of his workers that he kept brushing aside, which was referenced multiple times throughout the film. This implies he's also growing, becoming more open to other ideas. Now sure, it's from being completely pushed against the ropes as well, but again, these are common hero tropes. Okay, so the beam collapses and Spider-Man's still alive, at this point, the vultures probably wanted to kill him, but remember, Spider-Man has been a, the aggressor throughout this whole film, and the vulture wasn't expecting this to happen. He executes a plan to get a plane full of Jatari technology without hurting a single person. And once again, Spider-Man just won't leave him alone. They fight again on the airplane, they fall down and fight on the beach, and he has Spider-Man pinned on his back against the floor. He's jabbing him with his wings and Spider-Man's dodging, but Spider-Man is definitely tired and he's against the ropes, and there's definitely an opening where he could have killed or maimed Spider-Man within the next couple of strikes, but he chooses not to. He never really wanted to hurt Peter or his family. He just wanted to scare him enough to stop him. At the very end of the film, we get a post credit scene that actually matters because it seems to resolve the Vulture's journey. Remember, this film began with the scene of the Vulture losing his livelihood and turning to a life of crime. Throughout the film, he becomes increasingly willing to do whatever it takes, but in this end scene, based on everything that's happened, he's no longer willing to do whatever it takes and does not give up the identity of Peter Parker, thereby protecting the person that has kind of destroyed his life. So it would seem like he's changed, become a better person, and that's the hero's journey, right? Or maybe there's an ulterior motive in keeping Spider-Man alive. I'm not sure. What I know for sure is this guy is a real three, five dimensional character with scenes only reserved for the best written heroes. He doesn't have to be a morally righteous person to be a hero. He just has to be a capable person that holds true to his values. He's smart, he's the underdog, and he does the right thing from his perspective. And his motivations are also unselfish. But what I like most about him is even after analyzing him to death writing this essay, I still can't pin him down. They gave him so many great scenes that gives us glimpses into his character. But like a real person, there's just so many layers. 
These are my thoughts, and I think the magic is that every person who sees this character and the performance will have a slightly different opinion. Okay, my main thesis is done. Let me just take a quick moment to gush about Michael Keaton. I was blown away and really enjoyed his acting choices. A lot of Marvel's characters, and especially their villains, are pretty overdramatic with the way they talk and move and the monologuing, but Michael Keaton gives a smaller and ultimately, I think, more effective performance. The action scenes he's in are great, but the best scenes for me were the smaller ones, the conversations where he's just shooting fear at people with a twitch of an eyebrow or a thin lip smile. He manages to be so scary, I think he could play the exact same character in a David Fincher serial killer movie and he'd fit right in. It feels like he's in a different movie and it shouldn't work, but it does because Michael Keaton. Obviously, if you can't tell, I loved Spider-Man Homecoming. I know this essay turned into kind of general thoughts on why the Vulture is a compelling character, but I honestly just wanted an excuse to talk more about the film. I didn't really touch upon Spider-Man, I wanted to keep this concise, but I don't actually think he's a villain. He's also fighting for his city and family, but he does cause tens of millions of dollars of collateral damage, and in real life, people probably would have died, but he meant well, so that's okay, right? Maybe they're both heroes in their own ways, but in my opinion, the Vulture has a slightly better hero report card. I'm sure a lot of you will disagree with me, and I want to know your thoughts. Who do you think was the hero of the story? What does it even mean to be a hero in the context of a movie? Once again, thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and want to see more movie reviews, Netflix and Amazon Prime reviews, Korean film analyses, video essays, and the occasional unboxing videos. Thank you guys, and I'll see you guys next time.